This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This chapter read by Zale Schaefer. A Tale of Two Cities. Book Two, The Golden Thread. Chapter Twenty One. Echoing Footsteps. A wonderful corner for echoes, it has been remarked, that corner where the doctor lived, ever busily winding the golden thread which bound her husband and her father and herself, and her old directress and companion, in a life of quiet bliss, Lucy sat in the still house in the tranquilly resounding corner, listening to the echoing footsteps of years. At first there were times, though she was a perfectly happy young wife, when her work would slowly fall from her hands, and her eyes would be dimmed. For there was something coming in the echoes, something light, afar off, and scarcely audible yet, that stirred her heart too much. Fluttering hopes and doubts, hopes of a love as yet unknown to her, doubts of her remaining upon earth to enjoy that new delight, divided her breast. Among the echoes, then, there would arise the sound of footsteps at her own early grave, and thoughts of the husband who would be left so desolate, and who would mourn for her so much, swelled to her eyes and broke like waves. That time passed, and her little Lucy lay on her bosom. Then among the advancing echoes there was the tread of her tiny feet and the sound of her prattling words. Let greater echoes resound as they would. The young mother at the cradle-side could always hear those coming. They came, and the shady house was sunny with a child's laugh, and the divine friend of children, to whom in her trouble she had confided hers, seemed to take her child in his arms as he took the child of old, and made it a sacred joy to her. Ever busily winding the golden thread that bound them all together, weaving the service of her happy influence through the tissue of all their lives, and making it predominate nowhere, Lucy heard in the echoes of years none but friendly and soothing sounds. Her husband's step was strong and prosperous among them, her father's firm and equal. Lo, Miss Pross, in harness of string, awakening the echoes as an unruly charger, whip-corrected, snorting and pawing the earth under the plane tree in the garden. Even when there were sounds of sorrow among the rest, they were not harsh nor cruel. Even when golden hair like her own lay in a halo on a pillow round the worn face of a little boy, and he said with a radiant smile, Dear Papa and Mamma, I am very sorry to leave you both, and to leave my pretty sister, but I am called and I must go. Those were not tears all of agony that wetted his young mother's cheek, as the spirit departed from her embrace that had been entrusted to it. Suffer them and forbid them not. They see my father's face. O oh, father, blessed words! Thus the rustling of an angel's wings got blended with the other echoes, and they were not wholly of earth, but had in them that breath of heaven. Sighs of the winds that blew over a little garden tomb were mingled with them also, and both were audible to Lucy, in a hushed murmur, like the breathing of a summer sea asleep upon a sandy shore, as the little Lucy, comically studious at the task of the morning, or dressing a doll at her mother's footstool, chattered in the tongues of the two cities that were blended in her life. The echoes rarely answered to the actual tread of Sidney Carton. Some half-dozen times a year, at most, he claimed his privilege of coming in uninvited, and would sit among them through the evening, as he had once done often. He never came there heated with wine, and one other thing regarding him was whispered in the echoes, which has been whispered by all true echoes for ages and ages. No man ever really loved a woman, lost her, and knew her with a blameless though an unchanged mind, when she was a wife and a mother, but her children had a strange sympathy with him, an indistinct delicacy of pity for him. What fine hidden sensibilities are touched in such a case no echoes tell, but it is so, and it was so here. Carton was the first stranger to whom little Lucy held out her chubby arms, and he kept his place with her as she grew. The little boy had spoken of him almost at the last. Poor Carton, kiss him for me. Mr. Stryver shouldered his way through the law, 
like some great engine forcing itself through turbid water, and dragged his useful friend in his wake, like a boat towed astern. As the boat so favored is usually in a rough plight, and mostly under water, so Sidney had a swamped life of it. But easy and strong custom, unhappily so much easier and stronger in him than any stimulating sense of desert or disgrace, made it the life he was to lead, and he no more thought of emerging from his state of lion's jackal than any real jackal may be supposed to think of rising to be a lion. Stryver was rich, had married a florid widow with property and three boys who had nothing particularly shining about them but the straight hair of their dumpling heads. These three gentlemen, Mr. Stryver, exuding patronage of the most offensive quality from every poor, had walked before him like three sheep to the quiet corner in Soho, and had offered as pupils to Lucy's husband, delicately saying, "'Hello! Here are three lumps of bread and cheese toward your matrimonial picnic, Darnay." The polite rejection of the three lumps of bread and cheese had quite bloated Mr. Stryver with indignation, which he afterwards turned to account in the training of the young gentlemen by directing them to beware of the pride of beggars, like that Tudor fellow. He was also in the habit of declaiming to Mrs. Stryver, over his full-bodied wine, on the arts Mrs. Darnay had once put in practice to catch him, and on the diamond-cut diamond arts in himself, madam, which had rendered him not to be caught. Some of his King's Bench familiars, who were occasionally parties to the full-bodied wine and the lie, excused him for the latter by saying that he had told it so often that he believed it himself, which is surely such an incorrigible aggravation of an originally bad offence as to justify any such offenders being carried off to some suitably retired spot and there hanged out of the way. These were among the echoes to which Lucy, sometimes pensive, sometimes amused and laughing, listened in the echoing corner until her little daughter was six years old. How near to her heart the echoes of her child's tread came, and those of her own dear father's, always active and self-possessed, and those of her dear husband's need not be told. Nor how the lightest echo of their united home, directed by herself with such a wise and elegant thrift that it was more abundant than any waste, was music to her nor how there were echoes all about her sweet in her ears of the many times her father had told her that he found her more devoted to him married if that could be than single and of the many times her husband had said to her that no cares and duties seemed to divide her love for him or her help to him and asked her what is the magic secret my darling of your being everything to all of us as if there were only one of us yet never seeming to be hurried or to have too much to do but there were other echoes from a distance that rumbled menacingly in the corner all through this space of time. And it was now about Lucy's sixth birthday that they began to have an awful sound, as of a great storm in France with a dreadful sea rising. On a night in mid-July, 1,789, Mr. Lorry came in late from Telson's and sat himself down by Lucy and her husband in the dark window. It was a hot, wild night, and they were all three reminded of the old Sunday night when they had looked at the lightning from the same place. "'I began to think,' said Mr. Lorry, pushing his brown wig back, "'that I should have to pass the night at Telson's. We have been so full of business all day that we have not known what to do first or which way to turn. There is such an uneasiness in Paris that we have actually a run of confidence upon us.' Our customers over there seem not to be able to confide their property to us fast enough. There is positively a mania among them for sending it to England. That has a bad look, said Darnay. A bad look, you say, my dear Darnay? Yes, but we don't know what reason there is in it. People are so unreasonable. Some of us at Telson's are getting old, and we really can't be troubled out of the ordinary course without due occasion. Still, said Darnay, you know how gloomy and threatening the sky is. I know that, to be sure, assented Mr. Lorry, trying to persuade himself that his sweet temper was soured and that he grumbled. But I am determined to be peevish after my long day's botheration. Where is Manette? Here he is, said the doctor, entering the dark room at the moment. I am quite glad you are at home, for these hurries and forebodings by which I have been surrounded all day have made me nervous without reason. You are not going out, I hope. "'No, I am going to play backgammon with you, if you like,' said the doctor. 
I don't think I do like, if I may speak my mind. I am not fit to be pitted against you to-night. Is the tea-board still there, Lucy? I can't see. Of course it has been kept for you. Thank ye, my dear. The precious child is safe in bed. And sleeping soundly. That's right. All safe and well. I don't know why anything should be otherwise than safe and well here, thank God. But I have been so put out all day, and I am not as young as I was. My tea, my dear. Thank ye. Now, come and take your place in the circle. Let us sit quiet and hear the echoes about which you have your theory. Not a theory. It was a fancy. A fancy, then, my wise pet, said Mr. Lorry, patting her hand. They are very numerous and very loud, though, are they not? Only hear them. Headlong, mad, and dangerous footsteps to force their way into anybody's life. Footsteps not easily made clean again if once stained red the footsteps raging in St. Antoine afar off, as the little circle sat in the dark London window. St. Antoine had been, that morning, a vast dusky mask of scarecrows heaving to and fro, with frequent gleams of light above the billowy heads, where steel blades and bayonets shone in the sun. A tremendous roar arose from the throat of St. Antoine, and a forest of naked arms struggled in the air like shriveled branches of trees in a winter wind all the fingers convulsively clutching at every weapon or semblance of a weapon that was thrown up from the depths below, no matter how far off. Who gave them out, whence they last came, where they began, through what agency they crookedly quivered and jerked, scores at a time, over the heads of the crowd, like a kind of lightning, no eye in the throng could have told. But muskets were being distributed. So were cartridges, powder and ball, bars of iron and wood, knives, axes, pikes, every weapon that distracted ingenuity could discover or devise. People who could lay hold of nothing else set themselves with bleeding hands to force stones and bricks out of their places in walls. Every pulse and heart in St. Antoine was on high fever strain and at high fever heat. Every living creature there held life as of no account and was demented with a passionate readiness to sacrifice it. As a whirlpool of boiling waters has a center point, so all this raging circled round Defarge's wine shop, and every human drop in the cauldron had a tendency to be sucked toward the vortex where Defarge himself, already begrimed with gunpowder and sweat, issued orders, issued arms, thrust this man back, dragged this man forward, disarmed one to arm another, labored and strove in the thickest of the uproar. "'Keep near to me, Jacques Three, cried Defarge, "'and do you, Jacques One and Two, separate and put yourselves at the head of as many of these patriots as you can. Where is my wife?' "'Eh, well, here you see me,' said Madame, composed as ever, but not knitting to-day. Madame's resolute right hand was occupied with an axe, in place of the usual softer implements, and in her girdle were a pistol and a cruel knife. "'Where do you go, my wife?' "'I go,' said Madame, "'with you at present.' You shall see me at the head of women by and by. Come then, cried Defarge, in a resounding voice. Patriots and friends, we are ready. The Bastille! With a roar that sounded as if all the breath in France had been shaped into the detested word, the living sea rose, wave on wave, depth on depth, and overflowed the city to that point. Alarm bells ringing, drums beating, the sea raging and thundering on its new beach, the attack begun. Deep ditches, double drawbridge, massive stone walls, eight great towers, cannon, muskets, fire and smoke. Through the fire and through the smoke, in the fire and in the smoke, for the sea cast him up against a cannon, and on the instant he became a cannoneer. Defarge of the wine shop worked like a manful soldier two fierce hours. Deep ditch single drawbridge, massive stone walls, eight great towers, cannon, muskets, fire and smoke. One drawbridge down. Work, comrades, all work. Work, Jacques one, Jacques two, Jacques one thousand, Jacques two thousand, Jacques five and twenty thousand. In the name of all the angels or the devils which you prefer, work. Thus Defarge of the wine shop, still at his gun, which had long grown hot. To me, women, cried Madame his wife. What? We can kill as well as the men when the place is taken. And to her, with a shrill, thirsty cry, trooping women variously armed, but all armed alike in hunger and revenge. Cannon, muskets, fire and smoke. 
but still the deep ditch, the single drawbridge, the massive stone walls, and the eight great towers. Slight displacements of the raging sea made by the falling wounded, flashing weapons, blazing torches, smoking wagon loads of wet straw, hard work at neighboring barricades in all directions, shrieks, volleys, execrations, bravery without stint, boom, smash and rattle, and the furious sounding of the living sea, but still the deep ditch and the single drawbridge and the massive stone walls and the eight great towers, and still Defarge of the wine shop at his gun, grown doubly hot by the service of four fierce hours. A white flag from within the fortress, and a parley, this dimly perceptible through the raging storm, nothing audible in it. Suddenly the sea rose immeasurably wider and higher, and swept Defarge of the wine shop over the lower drawbridge, past the massive outer stone walls, in among the eight great towers surrendered. So resistless was the force of the ocean bearing him on, that even to draw his breath or turn his head was as impracticable as if he had been struggling in the surf at the South Sea, until he was landed in the outer courtyard of the Bastille. There, against an angle of a wall, he made a struggle to look about him. Jacques III was nearly at his side. Madame Defarge, still heading some of her women, was visible in the inner distance, and her knife was in her hand. Everywhere was tumult, exultation, deafening and maniacal bewilderment, astounding noise, yet furious dumb show. The prisoners! The records! The secret cells! The instruments of torture! The prisoners! Of all these cries and ten thousand incoherencies, the prisoners was the cry most taken up by the sea that rushed in, as if there were an eternity of people as well as of time and space. When the foremost billows rolled past, bearing the prison officers with them and threatening them all with instant death if any secret nook remained undisclosed, Defarge laid his strong hand on the breast of one of these men. A man with a gray head, who had a lighted torch in his hand, separated him from the rest, and got him between himself and the wall. "'Show me the North Tower,' said Defarge. "'Quick!' "'I will faithfully,' replied the man, "'if you will come with me. But there is no one there.' "'What is the meaning of one hundred and five North Tower?' asked Defarge. "'Quick!' "'The meaning, monsieur? Does it mean a captive or a place of captivity? Or do you mean that I shall strike you dead?' "'Kill him!' croaked Jacques III, who had come close up. "'Monsieur, it is a cell. "'Show it me. "'Pass this way, then.' "'Jacques III, with his usual craving on him, "'and evidently disappointed by the dialogue taking a turn "'that did not seem to promise bloodshed, "'held by Defarge's arm, as he held by the turnkeys. "'Their three heads had been close together during this brief discourse.' and it had been as much as they could do to hear one another even then, so tremendous was the noise of the living ocean, in its eruption into the fortress, and its inundation of the courts and passages and staircases. All around, outside, too, it beat the walls with a deep, hoarse roar, from which occasionally some partial shouts of tumult broke and leaped into the air like spray. Through gloomy vaults where the light of day had never shone, past hideous doors of dark dens and cages, down cavernous flights of steps, and again up steep rugged ascents of stone and brick, more like dry waterfalls than staircases, Defarge, the turnkey, and Jacques Three, linked hand and arm, went with all the speed they could make. Here and there, especially at first, the inundation started on them and swept by, but when they had done descending and were winding and climbing up a tower, they were alone. Hemmed in here by the massive thickness of walls and arches, the storm within the fortress and without was only audible to them in a dull, subdued way, as if the noise out of which they had come had almost destroyed their sense of hearing. The turnkey stopped at a low door, put a key in a clashing lock, swung the door slowly open, and said, as they all bent their heads and passed in, One hundred and five North Tower. There was a small, heavily grated, unglazed window high in the wall, with a stone screen before it, so that the sky could be only seen by stooping low and looking up. There was a small chimney, heavily barred across, a few feet within. 
There was a heap of old feathery wood ashes on the hearth. There was a stool and table and a straw bed. There were the four blackened walls and a rusted iron ring in one of them. "'Pass that torch slowly along these walls that I may see them,' said Defarge to the turnkey. The man obeyed, and Defarge followed the light closely with his eyes. "'Stop! Look here, Jacques!' "'A.M.' croaked Jacques Three, as he read greedily. "'Alexandre Manette,' said Defarge in his ear, following the leathers with his swarthy forefinger, deeply ingrained with gunpowder. And here he wrote, "'A poor physician,' and it was he, without doubt, who scratched a calendar on this stone. "'What is that in your hand? A crowbar? Give it me!' He had still the linstock of his gun in his own hand. He made a sudden exchange of the two instruments, and turning on the worm-eaten stool and table, beat them to pieces in a few blows. "'Hold the light higher,' he said wrathfully to the turnkey. "'Look among those fragments with care, Jacques, and see. Here is my knife,' throwing it to him. "'Rip open that bed and search the straw. Hold the light higher, you!' With a menacing look at the turnkey, he crawled upon the hearth, and peering up the chimney, struck and prized at its sides with the crowbar, and worked at the iron grating across it. In a few minutes some mortar and dust came dropping down, which he averted his face to avoid, and in it, and in the old wood ashes, and in a crevice in the chimney into which his weapon had slipped or wrought itself, he groped with a cautious touch. "'Nothing in the wood, and nothing in the straw, Jacques?' "'Nothing.' Let us collect them together in the middle of the cell. So, light them, you. The turnkey fired the little pile, which blazed high and hot. Stooping again to come out at the low arched door, they left it burning and retraced their way to the courtyard, seeming to recover their sense of hearing as they came down, until they were in the raging flood once more. They found it surging and tossing in quest of Defarge himself. St. Antoine was clamorous to have its wine-shop keeper foremost in the guard upon the governor who had defended the Bastille and shot the people. Otherwise the governor would not be marched to the Hôtel de Ville for judgment. Otherwise the governor would escape, and the people's blood, suddenly of some value after many years of worthlessness, be unavenged. In the howling universe of passion and contention that seemed to encompass this grim old officer conspicuous in his gray coat and red decoration, there was but one quite steady figure, and that was a woman's. "'See, there is my husband!' she cried, pointing him out. "'See, Defarge!' She stood immovable close to the grim old officer, and remained immovable close to him, remained immovable close to him through the streets, as Defarge and the rest bore him along remained immovable close to him when he got near his destination and began to be struck at from behind, remained immovable close to him when the long gathering rain of stabs and blows fell heavy, was so close to him when he dropped dead under it that suddenly animated she put her foot upon his neck and with her cruel knife, long ready, hewed off his head. The hour was come when St. Antoine was to execute his horrible idea of hoisting up men for lamps to show what he could be and do. St. Antoine's blood was up, and the blood of tyranny and domination by the iron hand was down, down on the steps of the Hôtel de Ville, where the governor's body lay, down on the sole of the shoe of Madame Defarge, where she had trodden on the body to steady it for mutilation. "'Lower the lamp yonder!' cried St. Antoine, after glaring round for a new means of death. "'Here is one of his soldiers to be left on guard.' The swinging sentinel was posted, and the sea rushed on. The sea of black and threatening waters, and of destructive upheaving of wave against wave, whose depths were yet unfathomed, and whose forces were yet unknown. The remorseless sea of turbulently swaying shapes, voices of vengeance, and faces hardened in the furnaces of suffering until the touch of pity could make no mark on them. But in the ocean of faces where every fierce and furious expression was in vivid life, there were two groups of faces, each seven in number, so fixedly contrasting with the rest that never did sea roll which bore more memorable wrecks with it. Seven faces of prisoners, suddenly released by the storm that had burst their tomb, were carried high overhead. All scared, 
all lost, all wondering and amazed, as if the last day were come and those who rejoiced around them were lost spirits. Other seven faces there were, carried higher, seven dead faces, whose drooping eyelids and half-seen eyes awaited the last day. Impassive faces, yet with a suspended, not an abolished, expression on them. Faces rather in a fearful pause, as having yet to raise the dropped lids of the eyes and bear witness with the bloodless lips. Thou didst it. Seven prisoners released, seven gory heads on pikes, the keys of the accursed fortress of the eight strong towers, some discovered letters and other memorials of prisoners of old time, long dead of broken hearts. Such and such like the loudly echoing footsteps of St. Antoine escort through the Paris streets in mid-July, 1,789. Now heaven defeat the fancy of Lucy Darnay, and keep these feet far out of her life, for they are headlong, mad, and dangerous, and in the years so long after the breaking of the cask at Defarge's wine-shop door, they are not easily purified when once stained red. End of chapter 21